Self-esteem is the internal is the internal awareness of one's own preciousness. It's the internal knowing that one has inherent worth. And there's something very specific about that. It's it's that and the internal awareness of one's preciousness in the midst of one's humanity. What this means is that self-love is about knowing that your humanity does not make you worth less or better than. I have been um, teaching this uh, subject to many, many patients over the years. I have been working hard on it myself. I have spent lots of time thinking about this subject and trying to get people to understand this concept. And you know what? Of all the things I've taught, of all the lectures I've given, this particular subject baffles people. One of the ways I get their attention is to tell them this, that when it comes to self-esteem or self-love, you're either doing it or you're not doing it. What I mean by that, I'll, I'll bring up something that happened years ago that really got my attention. I was, I was doing a, uh, I was training a bunch of therapists in Texas one time, and I, I uh, spent a lot of time with them in, in this, I think the subject was self-esteem anyway. And it, it came time for me to leave. I had to catch an airplane, so I really had to leave. And this lady raised her hand and she said, oh, Pia, just, just one more thing I want to ask you. I said, well, what is it? And she said, well, I want to know how I can raise my client's sense of esteem. And I said to her, if you are in that concept, if you are believing you can raise it, like the thing goes up and down, you really don't understand the nature of self-esteem. It either is in existence or it isn't. You either are valuing yourself or you're not. It cannot be raised up and down. It's a constant. And it's, it's about keeping in your mind, about being mindful that when you landed on the planet, when you were born, you came into the world, you came onto the planet with all the value you needed. And that value is equal to anybody else's value. One of the things about it, to, oh, I guess two things that I would mention right now, and, and that is, um, if you look around and you look at other people, one of the things that you see is that we're different. No, no matter what you're doing, look at anybody, you'll notice that we're all different. We think differently, we dress differently, we look differently. We have different levels of intelligence, different levels of beauty, uh, different levels of gifts, um, all kinds of things. We're, we're all very, very different. And one of the keys to understanding self-esteem is that those differences never affect one's inherent worth. They're, they're just differences. In my own personal growth, around this issue, one of the things I've learned is that as I look at others and I notice all these differences between me and, and them, that I have learned to look at the difference and do two things with it, if it's something that's really remarkable to me. What I do is I use the difference to learn something, or I look at that difference and appreciate whatever it is about them that's really remarkable instead of using it to make myself feel worthless. I think that that is probably one of the indicators that, uh, that a person is a pretty healthy person when instead of using differences to make themselves feel better than or less than, uh, one simply observes and appreciates and learns from instead of making it just a huge issue. Now, self-esteem is, is based on unconditional acceptance of self as valuable despite mistakes, failures, flaws, uh, losses, or any other kind of circumstance that is negative. The idea here is that you are valuable because you exist. And achievement and beauty and money and social position, etc., has nothing to do with your inherent work. That's more about the differences. Inherent in uh, worth is based in existence. Um, and, and what I've been saying is that having a sense of value 
has to do with whether you're paying attention or in the knowing that, it, that you have it, that it's there. Now one thing I want to note uh, here, and I read it in Matthew McKay's book, Self-Esteem, and by the way, that book is an excellent book um, to read because he, he makes many very, very important points about it, and he has lots of other information about it, so I recommend you read it. But anyway, what he said in there, or I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit, he said, feeling occasionally uncertain about one's own value is a, is a fact of your own humanity. Uh, questioning your self-esteem is a natural consequence of your own consciousness. In other words, when you have it, uh, you'll know, when you really have it, you'll see that you'll have it and then you won't have it, and then you'll have it and then you won't have it. What I just said, what Matthew McKay was saying is that it's normal to have it kind of come and go like that. In the process of recovery, though, we have it more than we don't have it. And we get better and better at knowing it than getting into the illusion. And believe me, these things are illusions that were worth less or better than. Now, what I want to do is some board work here. And what I want to do is show you how, how it's actually created. At least how I think it's created, anyway. Now, how it's created is that it starts with a thought. See, self-esteem is actually a thought. It's the beginning of self-esteem. The thought is, I matter as I am. See, and I just made a mistake here. I, I used a cursive, and then I used a, what, what do they call that? Um, anyway, the first thing you learn when you learn how to write. Anyway, so I'm now really screwing up now. So I'm making a mistake, and I'm being in my humanity, and you know what? That I made that mistake and that I'm on tape and you're watching that does not affect my level of self-esteem. What I've done here is make a mistake. That doesn't mean I'm worth less or better than or they don't know what I'm doing. I just did that because I'm human. Anyway, so I'm in the midst of my humanity here. I've made a mistake. My thought is and always is, as much as I possibly can do it, is I matter in spite of the fact that I've made a mistake. I matter as I am. I matter in the midst of my humanity. I have inherent worth in the midst of my humanity. I am valuable as I am. So in order to experience self-esteem or self-love, you have to have that as a constant understanding in your head. What that will produce, since thoughts produce emotions or feelings, first feelings and then emotions. And by the way, a feeling is a physical sensation in your body. The physical sensation of, of self-esteem or self-love is warmth and swelling in your heart. Interesting, huh? Warmth and swelling in your heart. You know, you know um, probably warmth is a word that, that you want to remember here. I know that probably all of you at one time or another felt warmth for another person, or you might say you felt compassion for another person you felt a heart connection to another person. You felt your heart opening and warmth to another person. That's the physical sensation of knowing that another person mattered as they, as they exist. Anyway, the physical sensation of love, the feeling of love is warmth and swelling in your heart area. Now, your brain will then tell you that that is self-love or self-esteem which in self-love or self-esteem is the emotion or the word, the emotional word we use to describe this physical sensation. And then what happens is that thought combined with the sensation drives one be one's behavior. So one's behavior then would reflect that you either love yourself or you love another human being. So let's just, let's just, um, look at how this might pan out. I'll, just, I'll use an example of what happened to me last night. Um, I got home late at night, and one of the things I know is if, if in this Arizona weather, I wind up getting hot and then I get sticky and all that sort of thing. If I try to go to bed and sleep when I feel all sticky, I won't be able to sleep and I'll have a miserable night. 
Now, I got home and it was late and I knew I had to do this taping the next day and all that sort of stuff. I'll just fling myself in bed and try to get some sleep. And then I said, hey, wait a minute. That's not going to take good care of me. And the next thought was, I'm worth taking care of here. And so what I, what I did is I changed my behavior. Instead of, instead of throwing myself in bed and trying to sleep, I jumped in the bathtub, took a quick bath so I felt better, and then got in bed. The behavior reflected the thought that I matter, and I matter enough to stop, get myself comfortable so that I can sleep. I spent the time and engaged the behavior that indicated that I really care about myself. I care so much that I take care of myself in my daily activities. So one of the things I've learned to do, it's like a discipline or a habit, or, and I call it spiritual practice. At some low level, I now have the habit of keeping in mind that I matter as I am. I matter as I am. I matter in the face of my humanity. Anyway, so if you look here, you'll see that love is a thought. It starts with a thought. It's experienced as a physical sensation and known as a feeling, known as an emotion. And if this is going on with you, your, your behavior will reflect that you love yourself. If the thought is about somebody else, like you matter as you are, I would have warmth and swelling in my heart for them, and my behavior would be towards them would be one of respect or one of love. Anyway, this is how you create it. So the most important thing here to remember is this thought thing. If you do not have this, you're not going to have it. So a lot about learning to esteem yourself is learning about how to hold on to that idea. And you know what? That will fly in the face of every single thing you have learned on this planet. This, this planet's a weird planet. This, this planet uh, does not know how to love, at least in our culture. Now, one of, the, one of the interesting things about self-esteem or self-love is, is um, how important it is. And, and the very simplest way to say that is that your, your ability to love yourself is the fuel of life. L love is the fuel of life. Love is what gives you energy, makes you feel alive and connected to others. It's extremely important to be able to do this, not only for yourself but for other people. Because it is the energy, the, the emotion from that, the energy from that emotion sustains you during difficult times in your life. Like when someone you love leaves you, or you lose your money, or your job, or uh, something, you know, somebody dies that you care about, and, that, and so that your life is affected in a very negative kind of deep way. Love, uh, Self-love allows you to be who you are not who somebody else wants you to be. If you really love yourself, and somebody comes up and says, I don't like that, I don't like you. You need to be this and not that, because this isn't OK. If you love yourself enough, you will give yourself permission to be who you are, even if the other person whacks themselves out over it. Now, I don't mean to say that we should stand on the planet, and when somebody walks up to us and says, I don't like that behavior, it's disturbing to me, we should say, well, who cares? That's not what I'm suggesting, because for all of us, when, when we see that somebody else is uncomfortable because of what we're doing, even though what we're doing is not breaking a rule, it's not assaulting somebody's boundaries, it's not being obnoxious or anything else, the other person is just whacking themselves out, we all have a responsibility in relationship with other people to listen to what other people are saying to us in terms of our impact on them. If you don't have enough self-esteem, what will happen when somebody tells us something negative that they've made up about us, what will happen is we'll either immediately adapt to that and try to please them, try to be nice, try to get them to like us or something like that, and step away from themselves. Or, if we really don't love ourselves, what will happen is that as they tell us, we'll have a shame attack followed by a rage attack, and we'll get obnoxious and sort of accost them for what they're saying to us. So self-esteem really gives you the ability to be who you are and be in relationship with other people in a way that's non-harmful to you or to them. It's a huge issue. Now, there are a whole bunch of terms that, unfortunately, people use thinking that they're describing their level of self-esteem. And I want to go down some of those. So 
you can take a look at this and see if any of this stuff applies to you. The very first um, concept is the concept of self-image. A lot of people mistake this for self-love. Now self-image is the image or the picture that you project, the picture of yourself that you project out to others to see. It's, um, it's your idea in your head about who, who you want other people to think you are. This has nothing to do with self-esteem. It has to do with how you want to present yourself to the universe. It may be close to who you are, it may not be close to who you are, but, it, but it's not self-esteem. The second concept that people mistake for self-esteem is self-concept. Now, self-concept is the intellectual evaluation of your strengths and weaknesses, i.e. whether you believe or don't believe that you are artistically uh, well endowed or mechanically well endowed or not mechanically whatever. It's, it's really about self-evaluation of your strengths and weaknesses. This is what you present to the public. This is your evaluation of your strengths and weaknesses. Another word um, that people mistake for self-esteem is egotism. You know, people will say, well, he's egotistical. He really thinks highly of himself. That is, and, and really loves himself. That is not self-love. Because see, self-love doesn't go one up to anybody. An egotist is somebody who believes they're better than. This isn't self-esteem. This is an illusion that the person has that they're actually better than, probably because somebody in, in their family of origin gave them the message that they were better than other people. This is not about self-esteem. This is about vast immaturity and illusion. Or you could say it's probably about delusion. Delusion is believing something in spite of the fact. So egotism this is not about self-esteem either. The, 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 uh, another term that people mistake for self-esteem is self-confidence. Now, self-confidence is a mental or emotional certainty that you can perform a task. It has to do with your, your performance. If you believe you can, you really have the ability to do something, you'll be confident or self-confident about doing that. If you don't think you can do it very well, you're going to lack self-confidence. Has to do with what you believe you can do or what you believe you can't do, uh, well or not well. It has nothing to do with self-esteem. Self-esteem is about holding yourself in warm personal regard in the face of your humanity. That, that is not about any of that up there. So the reason why I bring this up is that a lot of people um, think if I can, they can improve their self-concept or improve their self-confidence or improve the image they put out in the universe, that they're improving their self-esteem. And the point of this whole thing is, uh-uh, that's not going to affect your self-esteem at all. That's, these are about something completely different. Now. I want to shift to talking about the issue of self-esteem as a problem of culture uh, and as an issue of trauma. I, th there are many, many ways in which I can talk about the problem of self-esteem, but I want to kind of hone it down to two issues, the problem of culture and the problem of trauma, and begin with culture. It, it is the nature of humans. It's the nature of being a human being that we have the capacity to judge or note the nature of self and others and assign a sense of value to it. Um, it's, it's that ability right there kind of differentiates us from animals, that we can judge. And what, what um, I think Matthew McKay in his book, self Esteem makes this quite clear. He, what he says in there is that for centuries, each culture has identified what it is to be uh, of value. And in that culture, if you fall short of having whatever is valued, you would be considered worthless. In our culture, we have different things that we value. For example, we value doing the right thing, which to me becomes hilarious because 
who knows what the right thing is anyway. If you, if you really look at what going, what's going on, you will find that all of us have, uh, because we're such a, uh, a mixture of many different cultures, you will see that many of us operate off of a value system that differs from somebody else's value system. And when we talk about our culture valuing doing the right thing, what you'll see is that if your value system conflicts with somebody else's value system, and you do your thing, they will say you're doing the wrong thing, and they'll say what they're doing is the right thing. That's the nature of a value system, which shows you how crazy it is to value somebody because they're doing the right thing, because the right thing is really evasive. Doing, doing the right thing, though, is valued in our culture. Uh, keeping others comfortable is another thing in our culture that uh, makes, we think makes a person valuable. Fitting in, uh, you know, not rocking the boat, being nice that sort of thing. Achieving, that's a big one. You know, we, we put people up on a pedestal that are great achievers. What they probably are, not to be a cynic or anything, but what they probably are are work addicts. Looking good. Another problem is in culture, in, in our culture, is that we use perfection as a standard of appearance and behavior. Um, I, I suppose, uh, well, another way to say this is worth is attached to being good and perfect. This is absolutely crazy. When you get taught that perfection is the norm, what happens to you is you become allergic to yourself. You see, in this, there is no such thing as perfection for this species. No such thing. All of us have our warts and moles. All of us pick our nose. We fart, we burp, we make mistakes, we can be obnoxious, we can be wonderful, all these sorts of things. All of that is less than perfect. There's no such thing as perfection. And what happens when we get caught up because we're taught that perfection is the norm in our family of origin, what'll happen is we'll get on, tra on the track of self-rejection. Or we will begin to redirect the problem onto somebody else. We'll, we'll see them making the mistakes and we'll get into blaming and keeping scores and projecting problems and all this other stuff as a way to protect us and, and, and enable us to stay in this idea that we're perfect. We'll, we'll make everybody else wrong so we can stay perfect. And what we do when we do that kind of thing is we drive people in our life absolutely nuts because we're having to make them wrong so that we can be good and perfect. Again, imperfection is the norm for the species. I like something I heard um, Ashley Brilliant, uh, I think it's something he wrote years ago, and I'm not sure if I'm paraphrasing this or this is exactly what he said, but it's close to it anyway. He said, I always think of this one, I think of what I just said before, there are few things in life that really matter and they don't matter much. One of the things that uh, I think help us all learn to esteem ourselves is, is that we begin to develop an attitude of truly, most things in life really don't matter. These things like us burping and farting and picking our nose and making mistakes and all this sort of stuff, it's the human condition. It doesn't really matter. We need to give ourselves uh, space to be human and probably even more importantly, we need to give others their space to be humans and stop being so judgmental and going one up when we look at somebody's negative issues of humanity. Now I want to talk about the trauma issue and how it affects self-esteem. In a dysfunctional family system, what happens in the system is that as the child shows their humanity, you know, they do, they do something that reflects their humanity, like um, they spill their milk, or they scream in the market, or they pick their nose in front of some important person, or something like that. What happens if, if their parents are dysfunctional is that the parent will shame them. Now, as a way to get them stop, as a way to get them to stop doing whatever they're doing. Now, when I say the parent shames them, what I mean is that the parent does something to them that makes the child feel worthless. For example, the child will, will get bony fingered, will get called a name, will get told to shut up, will get told to disappear. Some, uh, anything like that is called the shaming process. 
And what happens is that the child will begin to attach their humanity to the sense of being worthless. There's a lot of therapy that goes on at the Meadows about breaking up this connection. What we try to get people to understand is that to be human is to be normal. To be human is to be flawed, and that your flaws do not make you worthless or better than. It, it, it only makes you normal, makes you human. So if a child has been sub subjected to the shaming process and made to feel shame about being who they are or about being human, what happens is that each time the shaming process goes on, the child is made to feel more and more worthless. And so when they come into the meadows and we try to treat this, what happens is that that sense of worthlessness is so ingrained that the person can't get into their brain the idea that they have inherent worth. One of the things we have to do to treat this is do what we call shame reduction work, because in essence, whenever a parent shames a child, bony fingers them, and tells them that there's something awful. What happens is that the parent is in a state of shamelessness. In other words, they are detached from their own experience of shame. When anybody detaches from their emotions, they, they radiate those emotions like cooties or germs out into the air. It's like they just puff them out into the air. You can't see this, but one can experience it. What happens is the child will absorb this shame and carry shame for the parent. The parent's been shameless. They're the one with the problem. But the child will take in the energy along with the thought that they're a jerk and carry energy that's attached to the thought and then step out into the universe with this idea I'm worthless and carry that energy that makes them feel um, worthless. And that's what keeps this stuff so ingrained in another individual. Let me just talk to you a minute about shame as an emotion. Shame is an emotion. It's the emotion we feel whenever we've been seen, whenever our humanity has been seen. It's, it's actually a very positive emotion because it is, it is the emotion that tells you you're human. And in essence, in, if we can feel shame, we'll never get in the god or goddess position. If we understand others, um, from this experience, we also understand that others are neither a god or a goddess also, then it keeps us from making other people our higher power. So shame, anyway, is, is a good emotion. When you feel your own shame, you feel embarrassed. And it causes you to kind of stop yourself or contain yourself. When you, when you experience carried shame, you feel worthless. Whenever you're feeling worthless, you're having what we call a shame attack, and it is an absolute lie. It's telling you a lie that you're worthless. Nobody's worthless. Nobody's better than all we are. All of us are human. Okay, now what I want to do is show you something about how most people in our culture generate a sense of esteem. They, they, they do it in two different ways, and both ways are really illusions. These things are taught to us by our family, mainly because um, in our families, neither parent really actually knows how to esteem from within, so they teach us kind of crooked ways to do it, not to blame them or anything, but this, this is something I think is important to take a look at. The, the, uh, the first way we give ourselves the illusion of value is to pay attention to um, or to rely on others' affirmation of us as a way to feel good about ourselves. And what this means is that because you're not affirming yourself in, the, in, in terms of saying, I matter as I am, what happens is that you rely on others to tell you how wonderful you are. And, and so that when, when anybody is actually saying to you how wonderful you are, you have a, a, a sense of value because they're confirming it for you, they're telling you this. The problem here again is that you're not generating from within, you're actually dependent on other people to tell you that you're okay, which I think is an issue of huge immaturity. Now, 
one of the problems with this is, first of all, you wind up dependent on somebody else. But the second problem with it is, because of the nature of mankind, is that probably for every affirmation, you're going to get something negative back from the universe. You see, because other people are using um, what I call reality-based esteem as a way of esteeming themselves, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but basically, because they're using this as well as this to get a sense of esteem, what they're doing with this is they're going through life looking at other people and comparing themselves to the other people to figure out if they're less than about even or better than. People do this habitually and so they're walking around and occasionally they'll note something to affirm because generally speaking the person they're affirming isn't a threat to them. But they're also looking for negative things because as they view that negative thing it makes them feel better than. And since that's the way they get an experience of value by making you wrong and them right or making you less than or them better than, you're going to get from the universe both negative and positive things. And if that's the only way you know how to measure your value, when you get affirmed, you'll feel good. When you get uh, some negative feedback, you're going to feel bad about yourself so that your sense of value will fluctuate according to who's talking to you. At one point you'll feel okay. And the next point, you'll feel worthless, or inadequate, or stupid, or ugly, or fat, or whatever it is that this message entails. And your sense of value will take a plunge. So two things wrong with, with uh, waiting for the universe to affirm you. It, it, w one thing is it makes you dependent on that. And the second thing is, is, is that you're going to get negative po and positive, And your sense of value, even if it's an illusion, will cause you to wobble internally. So whenever you go one down, you're going to start feeling unstable. The problem is whenever you go one up, it actually gives the illusion of stability. But anyway, whenever you go down, down, you're going to get very unstable. So it's risky business to depend on the universe to confirm your value. And besides that, it's just somebody else's opinion anyway. And it really doesn't matter that much. What matters is your reputation with yourself. Let me go back to this reality-based esteem. People either rely on others to affirm that they're okay, or over here, they use judgment to, to figure out whether they're less than, about even, or better than. They'll take their body, their minds, or ability to think, their emotional health, and their behavior, and compare it to somebody else's body, mind, emotions, or behavior and measure it to see, well, is my body better looking than your body? Can I think better than you can? Am I emotionally more stable than you are? Like, I'm, my emotions are available to me. You're walled in and shut down and therefore emotionally unhealthy and I'm better than because I can do that better than you can. Or I'll compare my behavior to your behavior, which is usually about comparisons of, a, of your value system. Well, I didn't do that and you did and you're wrong and I'm right and I'm better than, this sort of thing. So what happens is we go through life doing a constant inventory of how we measure up to other people and wind up feeling less than, about even, or better than. So our sense of value, even if it is an illusion, because it is an illusion, wobbles again and makes us feel very unstable. And I'll show you what that wobbling is about. The easiest way to talk about that is to talk about the inherent experience of value combined with the inherent or internal experience of power combined with the internal sense of abundance. Now, if you're a healthy person, you will have a sense of value generated from the thought that you matter as you are. You will get your power from self-control and self-containment and living in action to the universe rather than reaction to it. And you'll get your sense of abundance from good self-care. If you're dysfunctional, you'll get a sense of value from affirmation from others or from measuring yourself. You'll get a sense of power from trying to control other people or be manipulative. 
and overpower them or, and you'll get your sense of abundance from from being the source of money or this sort of thing where you have some control now so the trick is is to learn to understand your inherent worth to self-contain and let others be who they are protect yourself when who they want to be is offensive to you and engage in good self-care now the problem when you're not doing that what I just mentioned and you're you're developing you're developing these senses inappropriately what will happen is that um, if as you're doing that and generating it inappropriately and you go one up and start feeling better then and you become very controlling and you have to be the big kahuna here the uh, source of all the abundance in the family usually controlling the money and stuff like that when you go above this line up into this one up position here you'll be very very offensive but feel stable you have the illusion of stability it's really kooky there's so much illusion in life it really amazes me we get so sidetracked and make it so important it's all just an illusion anyway when you allow your value to drop because you're not paying attention to it and you're letting somebody else tell you you're worthless or you're calling yourself worth or something like that, when you let this thing drop you will start feeling worthless the thing about it is is that all three of these are attached together if any one goes down the other two go down with it and if you tell yourself that you're worthless your sense of power is going to drop and you'll start feeling powerless or helpless and your sense of abundance will drop even if you are abundant it'll drop it's an internal experience created by how you're generating that or not generating it if you let this drop you'll start feeling hopeless which is probably why there's so much depression in the world in our culture anyway because whenever you combine worthless powerless and hopeless man you are going to feel depressed now going back to why I originally brought all this up is whenever you're fluctuating back and forth between these two extremes these two things fluctuate and these two things fluctuate when you go when you go up here you're going to be offensive when you go down here you'll be the big victim and feel depressed and absolutely god awful so if you'll find if you're not generating these in a healthy way and this is the big the big one that's the most wobbly for everybody you're going to be fluctuating between being an offender and being a victim uh, being being um, uptight or being miserable so I mean when you when you don't monitor this and generate it in a way that's really appropriate what's going to happen is your life is going to become quite chaotic because this thing is wobbling and again this wobbling is an illusion you believe it but it still is an illusion so again healthy people know they matter they know they're not better than or less than they know they matter as they are what they do in, in regards to issues of humanity that are that have negative impact on others is that they are willing to contain it even if some of it really isn't about boundary violation they're willing to contain it in the interest of other people's comfort but not to the point where they make themselves a victim they will take a stand when they need to they gain a sense of power from self-control or self-containment that has to do with this part of one's boundary system and they have an attitude of moderation which also brings them a sense of power and they develop abundance from take, taking care of their needs and their wants I'll tell you what making sure that your needs which are things you have to have done in order to survive and combining that with getting what you want your wants are, are what to actually bring you joy but you don't have to have it joy brings you hope and hope is what gives you a sense of abundance here when you combine these two together and take responsibility for that you will have a sense of abundance interesting thing if you're able to generate it properly and you don't wobble you will feel stable you will feel abundant you'll feel that your life has opened up like a rose and is worth living and that is recovery being right across this line is recovery okay another thing that's about recovery is disputing the shaming process and that's a long journey what that means is if somebody has shamed you as a kid and you've taken in the idea that you're worthless in some way carry this horrible energy that makes you feel worthless and are subject to having shame attacks part of the discipline of getting out of that is learning how to dispute the shaming process learning how to dispute 
the shame attack or understand that the shame attack is a lie. You are not worthless. It's about what somebody else being shameless and treating you as though you were worthless. It isn't a fact. It, learning how to dispute that internal, internally and relieving yourself of the carried energy is part of recovery and part of recovering a sense of value that you were given when, when uh, you, you were created. Another thing that's about recovery and getting to the point where you can really value yourself is learning that making mistakes, big or small, are part of life and indeed how we learn. A lot of recovery around your self-esteem issues is beginning to understand that the mistake is not the problem. The problem would be, uh, uh, did we, the problem would be uh, over the issue of whether we learned from our mistake or not. Mistakes are normal. Mistakes are part of the learning curve. That we're actually making mistakes means that we're learning and progressing. Having that attitude on board and being willing to make mistakes and not attaching our value to making mistakes is part of the recover recovering the sense of, of uh, sanity. Um, also another thing that has to be done in regards to learning how to stabilize your sense of value or self-esteem is learning to handle criticism functionally. Um, Matthew McKay kind of defines this really good in his book. You can tell I really like his book. But anyway, um, he talks about functional criticism. And basically, what he says is that when you're getting criticized, um, understand that somebody's um, just telling you that uh, they're, they're making themselves miserable about something about you. Now. Functional criticism is criticism where they make a statement about what's bothering you, them, and then they give you the data around it that supports what they've said. That's functional criticism. And that you want to pay attention to, because what they're saying is, hey, I'm having this experience of you in the universe. And what they're telling you is how they experience you, which is really more about them than it is about you. But it's a way that they're being intimate, connecting, asking you for help so they can be more comfortable and you have an opportunity to adjust yourself, uh, not make yourself feel worthless. So you have to listen to whether what somebody's saying to you is functional or not. Functional means that they've given you the data so that you can decide whether it's true or not. Dysfunctional criticism is criticism given to you where people are just making general statements and they cannot back it up with any specifics. In my life, when I'm getting that kind of thing, and I hear that they're not giving me anything so they understand how they arrived at that, I know it's dysfunctional. So I'll say, hey, can you give me the data around that? When they say no, but you're always doing it, I say, well, when the data comes up, tells me, and I ignore it until I get the data. That's part of protecting my sense of value. Another part of protecting my sense of value is paying attention to, attention to my offensive behavior and correcting it giving myself permission to be me, but also not to be out in that universe uh, in a way that's, that truly violates other people's boundaries. And in that, when I haven't been a boundary violator, having the willingness to adapt myself to someone else in the interest of their comfort, in the interest of the relationship without betraying myself too much. Probably in summarizing this whole uh, presentation to you all say I, I think of the uh, the old uh, spiritual principle to thine own self be true um, it is most important in your life to be real to be yourself and understand that that has inherent worth but you can't be offensive you cannot be a boundary violator in that instant one has to pull it all in make amends and stop doing the behavior that has nothing to do with what you have or how much money you have. It has to do with good self-care. So